Hello, everybody. Uh, today we are uh, hosting uh, Ulaş Bağcı. Uh, Ulaş Bağcı is an uh, associate professor at the Northwestern University's Radiology, Biomedical Engineering and ECE departments at Chicago. And uh, he's a courtesy professor at the Center of Research in Computer Vision, Department of Computer Science at the University of Central Florida. Uh, he's also deputy director of AI Institute at uh, Northwestern University. Uh, his research interests are uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and their applications in biomedical and clinical imaging. Uh, Dr. Bajie uh, has more than 250 peer-reviewed uh, articles in these topics, and it's our great pleasure to have him uh, here today with us. Uh, please, uh, Dr. Bajie, we uh, would like to hear you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hande. This is a very kind uh, introduction. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, so today, actually, I'm going to talk about transport AI. And my passion and you know the particular interest is in healthcare applications. So I'm going to show some examples from imaging-based diagnosis, mostly from radiology uh, applications. Uh, so let me. So you know, in addition to what Hande said, I just want to uh, show a few. Uh, you know, the short bio images here, actually you see uh, a biosafety places at NIH, National Institute of Health, where I was working first as a senior fellow, staff scientist, and I was also co-manager for Center for Infectious Disease Imaging uh, from until 2014. At that time, infectious disease was not that popular like cancer. Now <laughs> we all see actually how important is infectious disease management. And we were working on like MERS, coronavirus at that time, Ebola, H1N1, tuberculosis, and many other things. So the aim was to, unlike cancer, you need to uh, image, and you see there's a tube there in CT images uh, for animal studies and also for patient studies. You need to isolate them. The idea is to find the, you know, the core components of infectious disease patterns and see where it started. And the vaccine group is working in parallel uh, and they try to develop, you know, the uh, suitable vaccines for the infectious diseases that we were working on. So pretty nice application nowadays, especially like this. It fits into the world's biggest problem now. And I was at UCF, which is one of the famous computer vision group. And I continue my, um, uh, you know, the primary research there, machine learning for biomedical image, uh, imaging and, you know, the image analysis. And of course I had, you know, teaching and other roles. So currently, actually, what we do in our laboratory is actually we develop machine learning algorithms. We also actually use machine learning algorithms, the, the developed ones, and apply them to important um, healthcare problems like lung cancer detection, diagnosis, and we have ongoing another project which is pancreatic cancer detection, um, which is is a very important problem. There is no standard screening, and if you early detect those cases. You help people actually. You you save their life, and we use utilize imaging, radiology imaging to do that. Uh, in addition to you know develop machine learning algorithms. Uh, we have actually in, in my group we have large scale uh, NIH fundings, and there is also a local funding from Florida where we work on uh, the cancer the radiation therapy with AI and uh, try to improve the personalized medicine and uh, improve the, uh, you know, the radiation treatment. So the idea is to minimize, uh, you know, the killing cells while maximize killing uh, the cancer cells. Uh, so basically we develop actual algorithms. So it is not really that easy to, you know, borrow algorithms from machine learning or computer vision algorithms and, uh, and then directly use it. In, in medical imaging have unique difficulties that we really need to uh, take care and, um, and adapt it into the you know healthcare settings, which is very challenging, and it is high risk application. So you need to be really careful uh, about its decisions. So you you know there is a trust issue that so we always ask why we should try you know trust decisions of the you know the AI algorithms, especially in these high risk applications. Like autonomous driving is also like a high risk application, similar to you know the healthcare here. So uh, after actually Northwestern uh, story, we start working on prostate cancer, brain tumor imaging, liver fibrosis, cardiac imaging, and many more uh, gastroenterology applications as well. It has a, a beautiful hospital with many, you know, the, the uh, imaging and you know the technological uh, advances that we try to utilize. 
Um, so in terms of you know the techniques that we work in our group is actually we develop uh, algorithms for medical AI applications. And particularly we focus on you know the two things like uh, also the our lab uh, name indicate machine and hybrid intelligence lab the hybrid comes from combination of like the human recognition and the the machine uh, so let's let's make the you know the ai less artificial and more actually realistic so we do human in the loop ai systems for most of these applications that we work the second one is the you know the explainability or you know the interpretability um, so if you actually explain the algorithm's decision, then there can be a trust that clinician can uh, can trust those algorithms and utilize them in uh, in the clinic. More, most of these AI algorithms don't really go into the clinic because of these adaptation problems, and many of them are also you know the black boxes. So we actually develop many successful algorithms, and many of them actually get uh, you know the uh, some uh, you know the first place, second place winner in international. You know the challenges some of our algorithms become also you know the televis uh, in, in uh, appear in the television here you see actually one of them i don't know it doesn't oops let me see okay so it doesn't actually play here i guess yep. don't watch tonight doctors using facial recognition technology to save so yeah okay i'm gonna actually skip that so these are actually two you know the television uh, program that shows to you know success of our lung cancer and the pancreatic cancer uh something happened sorry i need to share it again i guess oops from the algorithmic point of view actually our group is particularly focusing on you know, the capsule neural network based algorithm uh, of course we use also convolutional neural networks like the, the most famous ones uh, but we particularly actually work on capsule neural networks i will actually explain why we are focusing on this uh, so we have actually you know developed this the first segmentation image segmentation based you know the capsule neural networks in 2018 just one year after the the capsule neural networks come in 2017 we have this Bayesian capsule, explainable capsule, diagnostic, deformable, and recently actually we have also quantum capsules. So we call it actually the capsule soup. So in many of our applications, we use them uh, in addition to the, you know, the CNN uh, as baseline. It has actually pretty attractive features that I'm going to show. Uh, this is under the robust algorithm settings, pretty, pretty good algorithms. I'm going to actually select yes, switch some of this. This is, you know, the work from pancreatic cyst. Today I'm not going to explain this, but if there is any question, particularly related to you know the pancreatic cancer, that our group is the first one developing early cancer detection for pancreas, where is the, uh, where there is no screening strategies in the world, and we have this multi-center study, got pretty large NIH fundings and applying um, explainable machine learning to find uh, the cyst, uh, the pancreatic cyst, which has a high potential to turn into cancer. Uh, so pretty different approach than the you know the conventional machine learning algorithm, which is designed to go and find the tumor and decide if there's cancer or not. We particularly interested in the pre-tumors actually here and with explainable nature. Uh, we have actually we work on like the uh, geometric deep learning as well. So some of the you know the organs have not really flat, but it's, it's really you know in nature they have a uh you know non-convex natures and then we really need to change you know the, the nature of the deep learning to fit into this problem especially for surgery planning and we work also in mechanical in you know, engineering department for developing mini robots for uh you know the surgical assessment where we use the image guidance to uh with with the machine learning actually approaches uh, to help surgeons and uh, related to COVID, we have this nature uh, communication article where we use, um, uh, again, explainable uh, methods uh, and you know, both detection and diagnostic methods. And we also actually go further now, actually, we try to understand the long COVID cases, like which patients are going to develop different pathologies after they are recovered from uh, you know, the COVID. So this is also very inter interesting because we don't really know what will happen to the COVID patients. Uh, you know, the afterwards, so we work with uh, NYU and other centers to to predict which patients will need, you know, will develop, you know, different pathologies, especially in the lung. 
uh, from the algorithmic point of view today, actually, I'm not going to mention this, but uh, if there is a question also, I can also tell. Uh, so we have, a, you know, the, the, there is this famous algorithm called DRATCAM, and especially this last year, scientists noticed that, uh, you know, this is the visualization algorithm. It shows where the algorithm learns, and usually scientists are use, using this algorithm to show as an explanation module. It is not a completely explanation, but it shows actually where the algorithm learns. We have shown that DRATCAM is really suboptimal, and we develop another algorithm called EBA, Information Bottleneck Attribution Based. Uh, visualization and um, we use this actually the visual explanation it is more subjective however uh, you know uh, radiologists and other clinicians wants to see uh, where the algorithm learns for this this, this decision uh, this is a, a new algorithm the basic idea actually is very simple you try to uh, you know you have an input uh, and output so what happens is that you try to minimize the information you pass from encoder to decoder any deep learning settings any deep learning settings and at the same time you want to actually maximize the decision so what minimum information you need from input to have the same class information so that's very easy a very actually intuitive you know the definition so with that minimal information you just go and map uh, you know the where the algorithm learns i'm going to just show one uh example about this so input image is city with COVID. there is a subtle you know the ggo pattern is on the left uh lung uh, you see by arrow and our algorithms is showing very concise localization without actually uh, even supervised label it just shows where you know the algorithm learns if it is a COVID or not and if it is severity while the you know the famous grad cam actually fails and there are many failing examples like this actually uh, I can also show, but I'm going to just uh, skip this. Okay, so today's talk, after all this introduction, I want to say, you know, the, when we say trustworthy AI, actually, I, in, in my laboratory, actually, we, we can select many more cases, but we uh, focus on three things for high-risk application. One of them is uh, the robust algorithms. The algorithms should be robust, and actually, uh, you shouldn't really, uh, you know, the failed algorithm with simple changes in input or in the network. The other one is explainable. So your decisions should be explainable to the physicians and the radiologists so that they can trust uh, your system and it can be adopted into the clinics. And the other one is the hybrid learning, which is like the computers are very good at you know, the local task, like delineation and many other things and make your job easier by efficiency. But high level tasks like the recognition, still humans are uh, much better. And ma many of those secondary algorithms are in clinics actually is we know that uh, you know, uh, the experts should really decide actually still based on the input data. So we think that actually the human, especially in high risk application, human should, um, you know, behave together with the computer algorithms that we call hybrid learning. And this is a little bit different than the, the conventional second opinion tools that I want to try to, I will try to show that the true collaboration can happen if there is a human uh, computer interface is actually built um, reliably. For hybrid learning today, I'm going to show that we can do this human computer interaction with eye tracking. It can be with any other things like the virtual reality, mixed reality, keyboard, mouse, and many other things actually can be included here based on application. Here, you know, we use eye tracking based on, you know, the old radiologists are using their eyes to define, actually to detect, diagnose. And we use this seamless integration of eye tracking into the radiology rooms. For robust algorithms, we choose actually capsules family, which are general and it has very uh, many attractive, um, you know, the features to be used. And for explainable algorithms, actually, we divide them into the two uh, components. One of them is, is uh, you know, the, this is radiographical explanations as we do radiology image analysis, and it can be also visual uh, explanations like I show EBA, GradCam, and similar families. So, you know, later I'm going to show that this uh, explanation is really subjective issue. So explainable to whom? So in our case, it is the radiologist uh, or pathologist or endoscopist. So based on the problem, actually, every time we need to define what is, you know, the explainable. Uh, so I'm going to come into that point, actually. So first, I want to actually start with the clinical motivation, you know, how we started all our journey with, you know, like lung cancer, pancreatic cancer and all other things. And then I will show actually, how, you know, how we first time actually integrated, uh, you know, eye tracking technology in radiology rooms, which is kind of the real radiology room settings, 
and it, it works in re real time. Initial experiments actually was in nearly real time, but now it is real time. And it is seamless integration with almost no uh, you know, obstacles for you know, the radiologists and clinicians. Later, actually, we, uh, after this clinical motivation, we expanded actually our research into you know, many other cases, and it, it is generalized well into other organs like prostate, pancreas, brain, and even non-medical imaging. Actually, I will show one example that how we use mixed reality uh, glasses in our trustworthy AI settings. So the lung cancer actually is probably one of the most visited uh, topic, especially for AI researchers, uh, because it, is, it has been known that actually the lung cancer can be detected with the low dose CT scanning in the early phases. And, we, and early phases, if you can see, you know, this graph actually is that, you know, more than 90% chances you can save people's life. So early uh, stage uh, detection is, you know, critical in, in this case. And this is the famous New, uh, New England Journal of Medicine uh, article showing that the, the use of radiology imaging uh, can reduce the mortality from lung cancer. But it's very challenging to really uh, do that with just naked eye. So that's why actually many researchers are developing AI to help radiologists. So the goal is actually to detect stage one lung cancer, early detection, usually these lung cancer tumors nodules, actually we say nodules is pretty small and it looks like you know, also other normal tissues is pretty difficult for radiologists and uh, around 30 to 40% rate, you know, they can miss these tumors, even the, you know, the day search. Of course, there are many reasons for you know, the missing these tumors, which I'm gonna mention in a few slides. So it will decrease the, you know, the, the mortality if it is done properly. And the CT imaging is the key here for the low dose. Uh, so here you see there are different kinds of nodules seen. And um, so it can be anywhere in the lung. It can be in different shape, different intensity patterns. Pretty, you know, the difficult case. So for those who don't really know about, you know, how radiology rooms and how uh, radiologists are reading the scan. So usually they have multiple screens, very dark environment with little, uh, dedicated light source um, and limited distraction. So they search actually from different views all these, uh, you know, the images and the very high quality screens, very expensive ones, and they do visual uh, search. And when they find it, uh, usually actually they record it. In the past, they were using keyboard. Now there's the, you know, the text to, uh, the speech to text technology for reporting. You see a microphone is there. And um, so there are many actually software, usually, you know, the radiologists are doing this very fast in a few minutes, to up to five minutes, and they really need the software that is not distracted, distracting them. And it should be, you know, the help, helping them with a, with a very short interval and with little uh, interaction. So I have worked in clinical centers for many years, and I see that actually if, they, if the softwares have many buttons and it's difficult to use it, nobody's gonna use it. So it should be, you know, uh, for doctors, no buttons, anything, it should work automatic and immediately it should tell the results and it should be intuitively explainable so that you can actually adopt them into the clinics. And especially in community hospitals, they don't really have more than two, three minutes for pa patients uh, for CT screening. So considering that the problem is not only from the accuracy point of view, but also from uh, efficiency point of view. And there are many cases, many reasons that why they miss the, you know, um, the lung cases, lung uh, tumors. So here, if you see actually these CT scans, uh, some of the vessels look like the, you know, the tumor cases. So there's a little uh, nodules here in this CT scan. It is just right there and it is really easy to, you know, the miss that. And after, you know, the, the six months, if the patient comes back to hospital, uh, probably this is gonna be actually in another stage, stage two or stage three, and the patients will have, you know, the low survival rate. And, you know, another very important reason that we started actually this uh, study and uh, understand actually the, uh, the need for having a, um, a tool to interact with the computer is that the biases in radiology, there are so many biases that humans are missing. So they may be tired, they may be, you know, the fatigue or other things uh, happening with the radiologists, I mean. Uh, and so many actually biases are actually included in the um, uh, literature. Two of them are the most common and very important. One of them is called satisfaction of search. When the radiologists see some other patho pathologies, they may be satisfied with their findings and they may just stop searching and they may miss the tumor. The other one is inattentional bias, which means the uh, from a different angle, actually, they look like, a, you know, the similar, these tumors may look like, a, uh, you know, the normal tissues and maybe just um, 
uh, it may be in a blind spot. And so this is one of the reasons that they also miss. So around like, again, like 30 to 40% you know, the missed cases happening. And overdiagnosis is another significant bias. Actually, it's leading to unnecessary treatment. So this is also another, uh, you know, the drawback of um, uh, the lung cancer, you know, the detection. So here in this picture, so this is a very famous actually CT scan where there is probably you also understand, you know, because of the visual settings so that there is a tumor in the, um, uh, the right, uh, sorry, right lung actually in the bottom part of the right lung. Uh, so, but there is also something here. I'm gonna zoom this. You will see. So there is a gorilla in the you know the left right. So according to this study, like in 2013, Drew Etan from Harvard and Jeremy Wolf is a good friend. So this is like 20 out of 24 radiologists didn't really see this gorilla because they they just focus on the other um, lung tumor. So this is showing that actually pretty easy for them to uh, miss, you know, the important parts. The solution can be, you know, the complete radio diagnosis system in the past or, or AI based, you know, decision support system. In the past, actually, before deep learning era, uh, expert knowledge, like the radiologists were analyzing all these lung nodules morphology shape, and they were telling, uh, you know, the histogram texture and shape based, um, you know, the predictors, uh, you know, that computer scientists should extract from images and then they do feature selection and then it goes to the classification. Now those, uh, you know, the handcrafting features turn into, you know, deep learning settings, all of them actually being done with, you know, the layers of the deep learning and the decision is coming. So the detection, let's say. So that is our, you know, the topic. The problem actually even in the previous CAT systems and now current AI systems is that they produce many false positives. So actually human and um, you know, the computers have many drawbacks and many strengths. So we know that the radiologists can miss tumors. And we know that if you have an AI system to localize those small tumors, actually it will do a better job than human. And we also know that um, it is easy for radiologists to understand if a tumor is really tumor or tissue. I mean, if, uh, considering still that inattentional bias is minimized, uh, and at the same time, uh, I mean, I mean, radiologists have uh, not many false positive cases, but they can miss. So the, at the same time, machine learning algorithms, we know that they produce so many false positives. So what actually we uh, think is that actually we, we need a, the hybrid intelligence and the true collaboration that human can help computers and computers can help uh, uh, human uh, interactively. So what we propose is that actually have a, a machine learning algorithm which should be robust and having a less number of uh, false positives so that the job is going to be easier. And we need some explanation which we are going to use the radiologist explanation for defining a diagnosis or detection. And we need an interaction for this true collaboration. So how they can interact and we are going to use eye tracking that, that really fits into radiologist settings and many other application can too. So there are actually the system level approach like radiologist level eye tracking and also algorithm methods that for uh, uh, developing the novel algorithm that fits into our problem. Uh, so eye tracking technology actually previously like five, six years ago, we were using glass based eye tracking technology, but we switch into this stereo cameras system and uh, radiologists have multiple screen. So which was not really done in eye tracking studies as well. So we do actually multi screen and it is a dark environment and uh, uh, so what happens is that actually they look at the certain parts of the uh, screen, which is images in our case, and we record them. And not, we are not gonna only look at actually like a heat map where they look at it, actually, but we will do a quantitative actual analysis there. So we model all eye tracking regions, this, the gaze patterns, uh, so that we can combine them with the deep learning. We can combine them with the, you know, the machine. So the biological attention, we call it, unlike you know, how computer scientists are using this attention mechanism nowadays a lot. So we use the biological attention, which is directly coming from you know, the uh, eyes, like where the, from the gaze pattern, like where uh, radiologists are looking. So this is our initial system. So there is a PEC system, which is the radiology archiving system. It's, it's like the old uh, DICOM, the CT or MRI images are there. Radiologists are sitting there and looking at the, the, the screens. And we have this eye tracker device and the software, the, you know, the real time actually we collect them. And then this gaze data, we model them. I'm gonna show how we model them and go to the machine learning algorithm. We call it CCAT. 
or AI algorithm, whatever you can call, is collaborative CAT. And then actually this CAT systems is also uh, showing some uh, output to uh, radiologists and then radiologists can this, you know, decide or change their mechanism. And this is like a loop. So there is a learning mechanism here. So it can be like multiple stream. It can be in light environment or dark, dark environment and pretty flexible system. So unlike laboratory works where you force your actually readers to look at certain paths and only single slices, actually we do 3D, um, uh, 3D view, they can do zoom, they can actually switch their head into the different, uh, you know, the screen, they can change the contrast and all those things. And we record everything actually real time and then use. So how do we actually model this visual pattern like the heat map? from the gaze pattern so that actually we can combine them with the uh, with deep learning so it was actually pretty uh, straightforward for us so the gaze patterns actually is you just visited many the pixels right with your <coughs> eyes so the starting point and then many points actually the, the radiologists are looking and switching to the other points this is nothing but just directed graph so uh, we collected actually all these graphs and the points uh, these fixation points we call them like we can we can have like a nodes of the graph and the the, the saccades like the eye movement from the fixation point actually we can call this uh, as a edge between the nodes and this is normally directed graph we actually switch them into the you know the undirected graph for simplicity as for a simple you know the gaze data we combine we represent them as a graph and then we noticed that actually it's lots of points, lots of pixels are visited there. And for real-time application, we really need to reduce this without losing any uh, much information. So two things you have, too many nodes, too many edges in order to uh, actually remove uh, some of these unnecessary and repeated edges and nodes. First, we do non-parametric clustering. You can choose anyone. The only constraint we put here is that you need to have a really fast clustering system. So multiple, uh, in, in one region, you have multiple nodes, right? So what you can do is actually you just get one representative node to represent that region and you get rid of the others. So then you will minimize your nodes. The second, we will do actually graph specification. How? We define repeated edges and remove them. Uh, so first remove some of the nodes, then remove some of the edges, and you have a sparsified a graph representing your visual patterns, and that visual patterns go into your deep learning algorithm. So it can be detection. In, in this case, it is like a multitask. You know, you can detect the tumor and define if it is a tumor or normal tissue, and you can even segment it because morphology of these tumors is also telling something about the you know, diagnostic and prognostic features. So initially we were using CNN, but after you know the, our intention to robustify the algorithms, we change everything into the, uh, the capsule algorithm. So we don't have any restriction also here. That's a pretty generic system. Use eye tracking, specify it for a real-time tracking system, and then use robust algorithms for your multitask, which is usually in medical imaging is that you have classification, segmentation, and detection. And so there are these gaze analysis, visual attention, and the machine learning part at the system level so for uh, again like this is the you know current tracking device that we use is a fovio eye tracker system uh, stereo camera this is the, the typical visual map from eye trackers it is not quantitative as you can see and you want you know this is a long uh, image screening you know the from the city you see lots of nodes and edges are there for a typical screening this is this is really uh, you know a lot and that's why actually I was trying to say that you need to minimize this so that you can in real time put it this into the you know deep learning. And um, so we represent them as a graph. And um, and here actually from the raw data for in A, in B, we do clustering data to remove nodes like these color images you see, you just need to choose the one representative one and then get rid of them. And the, the last step is the specification repeated edges like your eyes actually go you know from one point to another point uh you know in radiology they visited many places again and again so you, you just need to remove those points uh, Ulaş uh, yes. sorry is this for just one expert for one patient or is this yes yes uh, this is one expert for one patient i'm gonna show three experts and different patients in the experimental part okay thank you 
So you see here the centroid of those nodes uh, can be used just representing those, uh, you know, the points that you can actually remove the nodes. And again, like we don't really have any constraint here, just one constraint. You really need to have a time efficient family of clustering algorithms. Any non parametric clustering algorithm will be choose. If there is a new one, it is going to improve our system, actually. It's the new, uh, much better ones. Uh, I'm gonna, since I have actually many slides, I'm going to skip some of this theoretical parts, but we can always actually go back. Very simple similarity functions, just checking the distance, like you know, many of these clustering algorithms. And for specification, it is you know the you know it is very old technique, but wor works pretty nice in our case. It is the Laplacian based metric. We uh, just look at you know the, the you know the Laplacian of the you know, the, uh, the graph, and we look at you know the weight of this uh, you know the graph, and the weights are coming from the attention. So you can also think like for every point, you know this radiologist look or we look. So there is a time component. If the time is high which means actually radiologists are spending a lot of time on that so that we increase the attention uh, component of this or they visited the same point again and again which means actually there is something ongoing in that region not necessarily tumor but there's an interesting thing going so we increase the attention you know the parameter this is a novel parameter we put attention parameters the biological attention and then actually we try to use this to you know the sparsify so here uh, I want to show these attention parameters that the number and the you know the time. So the number of nodes in each cluster, if it is high, it means actually radiologists actually look at again and again. So this should be uh, related to biological attention. So we need to increase the uh, attention mechanism. The other one is the self loops or the amount of time. So amount of time from the you know this eye tracker device, we we measure this for every node how much time they spend. So if the time is high. Uh, it means actually we need to also increase the attention uh, of that you know the region, and from I point I and point J you know bet between two uh, nodes, uh, we just combine this to create uh, this novel attention uh, weight parameters in our uh, you know the formulation. So this is a toy example. It's uh, like a dense graph, uh, and so we are actually now sparsifying the graph. Edge ratio 0 0.2 means 80% of the data are removed. And then, uh, you know, we, we are still having, you know, the structure of the, the graph. So intuitively, actually, we find in our case, like from 0 0.4 to 0 0.6, like the 60% of the data we remove, and we still have really good, uh, uh, you know, the graph structures that can be combined with deep learning. So this is the 3D version of it. After clustering, you see, and then sparsifying. And I'm going to show actually the, now the two examples from our, uh, you know, the cases. So this is how algorithm works. It's, this is really, you know, how it works, like what I described by uh, work. So this is the radiologist, the first radiologist. And um, look at one, you know, they look at the same patients that we choose randomly, and they repeated this experiment many times. So the first row actually shows the dense eye tracking regions, nodes. I didn't show the uh, edges because of you know it's too too many. That's why just look at the nodes, and after you know the time, look at the time analysis. It is uh, one twenty one second finishing one patient CT scan. Uh, it is two minutes. After that, actually we sparsify clustering and then sparsify. You say you have just uh, some points to embed into the deep learning, and it is good enough to you know to just pay attention to those digits. The system actually understand the deep learning is always working in you know in the background as a, you know the baseline detection diagnosis segmentation system but these are actually showing that you know the pay more attention to the, these regions so this is another radiologist uh, spending a little bit more than two minutes and this is the radiologist three spending almost five minutes and too many nodes and even for that one actually it works pretty nicely that if you look at the third row you will see uh, we significantly minimize the number of nodes and edges that can be embedded in the deep learning. And this is the, uh, the raw data, again, um, uh, from three different radiologists, how actually, you know, we go to do, you know, the specified data with edges actually uh, seen here. Okay, so there can be actually many uh, measurements, uh, these evaluation techniques to, you know, to look at how the information is lost and if it is useful. So here, actually, you can look at actually this Laplacian MSC, like 0 0.6, 0 0.7, like 60% of the data are removed and still 
we have a small, uh, you know, the MSC. And the other two metrics are also, you know, usually used in graph, you know, the, you know, the field to measure, you know, the how, you know, how much information actually you lost. Uh, in, in our case, like, you know, from different cases, 0 0.4 to 0 0.6, you know, 40% to 60% of the data we removed, and we got still reliable data for uh, working. So here's different colors shows different um, um, organs, like the, the lung, for, also for different radiologists. Uh, there is a lung and prostate cancer, uh, you know, the projects actually included here. Uh, again, this is just a remind, like, so if you have more number of nodes and the time spent, it means actually our attention region, uh, we give more attention to that region. So that we use that parameters to that. Uh, for, so, you know, I, as I said, actually, the detection is always working for deep learning detection diagnosis is always working in the background. And this attention mechanism should go and integrate it to that. So detection, like, again, like we don't really have any uh, huge constraint on using a detection algorithm. You can use CNN capsules or uh, maybe the most, you know, the novel and the, the new algorithm you can replace in our case. We don't have that constraint. So if you have a better algorithm, our system is going to work, you know, the much better. In the past, actually, we, have, we were having this... Um, you know the uh, this like you know consecutive systems for detection like uh, cnm based uh, detections and then you know it produces many false positive and then you have a false positive removal uh, you know the rcnm based fast rcnm based you know detection we're using but we actually of course uh, move into uh, better detection methods and then better detection methods with the attention mechanism when it is actually moved, we remove so many false positives very significantly. Um, so, uh, you know, in, in addition to, you know, this, in comparison to this CNN based methods for detection, for the first time, actually, we used 3D detection in medical imaging because of, you know, the GPU and uh, the large data setting, it was not that possible until uh, 2018 with a simple one single GPU to use 3D detection. So we propose this S4ND uh, project published in Mikai. It is a 3D CNN with dense, dense connection trained in end-to-end -end manner. And, uh, you know, now all those things are not novel, but for at that time, it was pretty actually good achievement, especially moving into 3D you know, processing of the medical imaging as a whole, as you can see here. So our idea was this. So where actually radiologists are missing? So catching the big uh, tumors is relatively easier. And the algorithm can do it, but where they really need help was small uh, tumors uh, that can be actually confused with the normal tissues. So we designed the algorithm to capture and focus on more like a small scale uh, tumors. That's why actually this uh, S4ND means actually a single shot, which means actually we don't really need false positive removal. Like most detection methods in medical imaging, they have a, another network to minimize this false positive. For that one, we are using eye tracking, right? So we are gonna minimize it already. And the single scale, this is what I tried to describe, which is like, let's focus on the small tumors only because that is what they uh, miss. So we use this dense connection and 3D, you know, the CNN and with single shot and single scale and obtained actually pretty good results like 97.2 with multiple cross-validation settings and it is like 95.2 sensitivity and the parameter size is also you know relatively small compared to you know the other uh, methods i'm gonna actually skip this so this is an interesting password for a given ct scan you in the middle slice you see some eye tracking map in the third row you see that so it actually, our system shows radiologists where they look at it, green, and where they didn't look at it, the, the red part. And for red part, our algorithm still works. And it shows you actually, there may be nodule there, and then you didn't really look at it. And we give them as a, uh, you know, the suggestion to um, radiologists, once they finish their reading, like at the end of two minutes, let's say, or your five minutes. So they are able to refine their, you know, the results and then they click just a few places and we update our algorithms based on this. So this is actually in red, you see the tissue at risk for misdiagnosis and pretty small and the algorithm is actually uh, capturing this. This is a nice collaboration is really happening there. Okay, so you know, we have this detection part. The other one is like, you know, we need to also do diagnosis. Usually actually 
this part is not going to be uh, getting FDA approval yet. I think it will take long. Still, actually, you know, um, uh, for the diagnosis part, the, the clinical standard is to get the biopsy for more, more patients. But, the, you know, the intention is that actually, you know, if AI algorithm can diagnose like at the biopsy level, so we do also, you know, the, the diagnosis and radiologists are still interested in seeing, you know, the diagnostic measurements. And it, it also comes with the morphological and, you know, the shape. So the shape of the, you know, the tumor can tell us, uh, can give us, you know, the, some uh, uh, clues actually if, if the, you know, the cancer is there or not, or it's a stage. So we still do diagnosis and image analysis like segmentation. Uh, so we do everything in actually in a multitask manner. So the reason is actually pretty simple. So uh, if the you know if you have multiple tasks to do like detection, segmentation, diagnosis, and if these tasks are actually um, affecting each other, so doing one of them is going to affect others. So it is better to actually model the problem as a multitask learning because the results are going to be better than the individual task alone. So it's a known uh, machine learning you know the topic. So we have that, this actually the multitask learning and we have actually pretty good improvement like from 88 to 95 percent from 82 to 86 percent from for detection and for uh, uh, segmentation tasks you see so you do actually detection diagnosis and segmentation and you do this in collaboration with uh, computer so once the decision comes especially for diagnosis uh, so we said that, you know, in order to have a trustable system, so there should be some kind of explanations. And explanation is not a, actually a, like all purpose, there is no all purpose definition. It is like a domain specific, uh, you know, the notion. So for autonomous, you know, the car driving, the, your explanations are going to be different than for lung nodule classification or pancreatic cancer classification or cardiac or brain. So for the lung, uh, cases for lung cancer. So we we have actually two things. So the explainable explainability part should be about the decision, and there is also you know another concept. People usually you know scientists usually use the interpretable. We call interpretability only for the model, like the, you know the AI model, not the decision. We separate these two topics. Usually you know they are used by interchangeably. But we try to actually, you know, separate this to make it, you know, the clear. So a model interpretation is different than, than the explanation. And we are interested in more, of course, in the explainable part to make a, a decision which can be trusted by clinicians. So interpretable to whom? In our case, uh, our uh, um, the radiologist will be the one interpret the decision. So where they come from is really the radiology room. So how they interpret, they look at the... Uh, you know, the textures, the shape, and the other intensity characteristics of the uh, nodules, and they come up with the, you know, the decision. When they write their report, they say, uh, you know, the, they talk about the margin, the lobulation, speculation, and texture of the nodules, uh, and they also, of course, talk about the probabilistic way with some uncertainties. So we use this, you know, the six um, visual attributes that radiologists are using, and we call this radiographical interpretation or radiographical explanation. So this is different than visual interpretation, like, you know, the uh, grad cam or others. So we have used like more than 1000 CT scans publicly available. There are six attributes provided by four different radiologists. And we are using these uh, visual attributes to define the, you know, the decision, uh, you know, the how, how, you know, the lung nodules are uh, defined, you know, the diagnosis uh, with respect to these visual attributes. Um, Again, like you can use CNN classification, we use capsule here for a given detected. So let's say you detected, right? So we have a system to detect these lung nodules and it goes to the, uh, the capsule network, we call it X caps. It means explainable capsules. It will actually predict the diagnosis is like the lung cancer or not, maybe in you know, other stages as well. In usually in capsules, you have also reconstruction path in the top, which is uh, for regularization purpose. So, but we are not happy with this, right? So you don't really want a system, it says just yes or no, you want those explanation. And we know that, at, uh, you know, the, uh, in our case, uh, explanations are gonna become with the predicted visual attributes. So this is, this can be considered like, a, again, like a multitask learning system, but here the predicted diagnosis also has relationship with the, you know, the predicted visual attribute scores, which are like, um, 
sublease, sparsity, marginal ovulation, speculation, and it can be actually be increased a lot, actually. So depending on the you know, application. And uh, so while we have like, let's say six attributes detection, we have also one diagnostic uh, prediction. So it's a total of seven predictions you will have. And then you need to explain the prediction with the, the sixth combination of the six uh, visual pattern. Okay, so you can ask easily why capsule initially actually I was saying that it has pretty good uh, properties that we, we choose capsules over um, uh, over you know the other CNN based method. First of all, actually it's store richer information. Uh, instead of just a point based prediction capsule says actually the vectors. And um, so because of that actually it, you can have really you know the uh, smaller number of layers and less number of you know the data to uh you know the, the combine the use the you know the capsules it is less prone to overfitting because of this richer representation and uh, also less you know our experiments show that actually you train your algorithm in a, in a few in a fewer epochs than conventional cnn compute the famous actually the part of the capsule is coming from this picasso effects like so in cnn because of the pooling operation you are losing a lot of you know the object and parts relationship uh, but in, in CapsNet, actually, you know, the capsule, you don't actually lose that information uh, because of the, you know, the vector representation of the, you know, the data. So, you know, the, in graphics, actually pretty useful uh, representation, you know, this capsule is pretty good. Probably, you know, the segmentation was not the, you know, the, uh, the best application for this, but actually we have done and showed that it, uh, it has, uh, you know, the small number of images you can use, you know, uh, and more than 95% of the data you re we remove and still get pretty good results and even better than the famous UNET. Uh, so it is, it is because of the, it stores, you know, the richer information because of the vectors uh, representation of the data. And I'm going to show actually even that you, you change the object, you know, let's say image a little bit and then, uh, you know, use one of these UNET or others algorithms that the algorithms were are failing while the you know the capsules are not really failing i mean of course there are failures but the less which shows you know this is robust uh, nature of it okay so uh, you know the classical unit is used for like segmentation or many other things as well so we basically what we have done is actually we uh, created the capsule in the u shape so that we can do segmentation and we introduced you know deconvolutional capsules in the decoder part of it and there is also, you know, the reconstruction part for the regularization and in the, you know, simple lung segmentation settings, we actually um, slightly, you know, to get better results than uh, like UNET and, you know, the tiramisu based algorithms, this 101, uh, uh, you know, the number of layers in, uh, in, in UNET kind of this fully convolution based networks. And while like UNET is using more than 30 million parameters, we were using just only 1.4 million parameters and with pretty robustness. Here, actually, you see UNET actually start failing when you rotate images, but the set caps, the capsule-based segmentation is more robust. So it's, it's, uh, it is robust, you know, the transformation, noise, and many other things. So here again, UNET shapes, you just actually transform this a little bit and it start actually failing while sec caps is more resistant so we we said that actually we want um, an algorithm which is interacting with the computers uh, with the human we want robust algorithms any robust actually choice of algorithm is good for us and explainability in our case i just show uh, like the radiographical explainability if you change the topic then you know the application the explanation is also going to change uh, Okay, so we, you can actually depend on the you know the problem. You can go to you know deeper with the explainable capsules. I just should warn that actually you know the capsule is a little bit more difficult to train com compared to CNN because of the lack of library support. And also still we have you know parameter wise we have less number of parameters, but still because of the vector representation GPU need is still high. So maybe that's why also the capsule is not really flying for everybody yet. But we have actually huge hopes because of the, uh, the robustness and the, uh, the, uh, the relationship that you can capture with this vector with, between the object and parts. Um, okay, so how we actually did this attribution vectors, attributions uh, with the classification, detection and segmentation. Uh, as I said, we have done this multitask learning framework. So where the, your first loss function is nothing but just the classification function. So this is the classical one. Then you have this reconstruction part, 
just in the top level of the uh, capsule, which is doing regularization, which is really important for deep learning algorithms. And we have, uh, you know, this additional loss function you can add. In our case, this is the attribution vectors that is coming from radiologists. So we learn from those scores from radiologists. We train them. And once we, our system actually tells something about detected, segmented, and tell about, tell about the diagnostic nature of it, it also puts the six visual attributes and show the relationship why this is cancer and from because of which visual attributes. This is how the system works, and it is nice to fit into the you know the clinical uh, workflow for the lung cancer, for pancreas cancer, for prostate, for brain. You need to change these uh, attribute vectors because for radiographical interpretation is going to be changing. But pretty much the rest is this is going to be the, you know the same. So what we expect also from uh, you know usually the explanation. Uh, explainable algorithm is that when you try putting more explanation like in you know the basic statistical algorithm right so regression it is more explainable but the accuracy is low cnn is getting you know the higher and higher number of layers is highly non you know highly nonlinear functions with black bags black boxes and what happens is that you get state-of-the-art results but it is not explainable so when you try to actually put more explanations so general trend not necessarily but uh, the general trend is that you are going to lose some accuracy so accuracy explainable the trade-off was uh, um i don't want to say hype but it is it is true that in many applications it's working like this so the, the 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 goal is to develop an algorithm which is as good as cnn or close you know approaching to the sota cnn while at the same time you increase the explanations in our case actually we got pretty close to the CNN applications while we increase the, uh, you know, while we increase the, you know, the explainable component of it. So if you look at the results here, you will see that non-explainable methods are close to like 90%. We got actually in, in, in 2020, our results, this explainable results were approaching like 87. Now I think it is around 89 to 90%, very similar to non-explainable methods. And while non-explainable methods do not say anything about these visual attributes, uh, the you know the practical practical benefit of the, you know our X caps is saying that so it it predicts all these attributes as well. So this is the the benefit, and it is very very close to the uh, state of the CNN, and, and probably it's going to be much better in the uh, near future. So one may actually ask actually not only like. Um, so the, one of the difficulties was like, as I said, like the single uh, screen, most of these eye tracking studies are being done. So we have done this, you know, the four or even five screens. It was an engineering, a lot of engineering effort, uh, but we have done this, especially for like in lung, probably you have seen just one single modality uh, and many of the radiologists open multiple screens. Uh, so they still look at the different views, but there are also cases like different imaging modalities are being used. So it is interesting to see like here in prostate cancer, there are four different imaging modalities and radiologists need to look each of them to understand if, if where the prostate cancer is, how they are gonna, you know, identify. So it is also interesting when you ask actually, especially expert radiologists, how they do diagnosis in most of the time, actually they are not able to explain properly actually how they do it. So the fusion algorithm, we want to understand how they really do that. So, so here you see that actually the, uh, there are four different modalities Radiologists mostly look at the structural images T2, but whenever necessary, he actually, in this case, actually look at the diffusion imaging, water information, and then look at the, you know, the, some contrast images when they need contrast uh, information, sorry. And very little time, actually, they look at the diffusion weighted imaging in the, you know, the left corner you see. So from this, actually, what we understand is that when you have multiple images, multimodality images, you put them into the deep learning for fusion operation, right? You do either early fusion or late fusion. From this eye tracking, actually, we see that actually, you know, they need different information from different uh, different parts of the uh, regions they actually combine. So we try to, you know, to develop like a deep learning algorithm. They just mimic this kind of intermediate fusion operation. And, um, uh, you know, we, we, we start actually getting pretty good results about this fusion operation. So here we understand what they cannot ex explain in practice. Another benefit, not only diagnosis and, uh, you know, the detection, classification, but what happens is that actually in medical imaging, especially collecting the data is very challenging and especially the labeling, it's very, very expensive. Radiologist time are very expensive. 
in most of the time we hire students to you know do this labeling but it's still very challenging and they need to learn all those things so we started the project so can we label these you know the uh, images without actually spending a lot of time on radiologist time so just when they go to the radiology room when they do their daily routine uh, screening can we put our you know the eye tracking device there and while they are uh, screening can we actually collect data to for labeling even it is just rough labeling but this is the way actually we can actually minimize otherwise in me medical imaging we don't really have image nets right image net more than millions of data is there with labels but in medical imaging it is very hard when you find 1000 images you become really happy so this is actually one uh, you know the screen sh is shot the figure showing that the neuro radiology applications where radiologists are actually looking without actual annotation anything just looking at the tumor and in the background we have this tumor detection and segmentation working it just needs some clue so when the radiologists look at certain points we segment very quickly and roughly it doesn't necessarily be just uh, uh, very refined once we collect the data then you can run another algorithm to refine the results and this is going to be uh, your labeled images so even in machine learning community, uh, we see that the, you know the scientists go back into the, now the data part a lot. So the collecting the data, curation the da data is very very important, especially in medical imaging. And we believe that uh, this uh, eye tracking technology is going to help to make this job actually more efficient and more innovative. And on not only MRI, you see in CT, ultrasound, PET imaging, this can be used. So it's pretty uh, you know the generic method. So before actually finishing, I just want to show that this is also useful not only for uh, medical imaging, but non-medical applications. So the idea was like, again, like from our laboratory. Uh, so it, for this is civil engineering uh, work where the inspector looking at the bridge and roads and try to see crack and other, you know, uh, you know, deformities in the road and the bridges. So we consider the problem like the medical image segmentation and medical image like the pathology detection. So the crack can be considered like a lung nodule or uh, you know, any other pathology. And there is a mixed reality headset here, the same algorithm and interaction. You see similar to eye tracking technology. And now we have uh, in, the, in the mixed reality headset, we have our algorithms for detection, segmentation, quantification. And the human inspector is just looking at certain points and then the, you know the, this interaction actually the works. Uh, I'm gonna start this, but I hope it's not gonna collapse again. Oops, sorry. It, so that was actually one of the last slides. So let me open quickly, and I think some, some problems with videos. Anyway. So you, you can see the screens, right? Yep. So here, um, so I'm not gonna show the video, but what happens is that it is a real time video uh, so when the inspector look at this crack, so what happens is that it detects and segment the, you know, this pathological area, which is you know, the crack, or it can be spall, or it can be, you know, some other, uh, you know, the deformities, and it also gives you, you know, the quantification, you know, the severity of those damages, and this is pretty useful for, you know, people especially working in different, you know, the difficult uh, conditions in in civil engineering from the distance, you know, you can measure all those things and it really makes the, uh, you know, the system more accurate and the, you know, the efficient. I'm gonna, yes, I'm gonna actually conclude my talk um, now. Sorry about videos. So eye tracking technology and mixed reality and, you know, many other actually in our lab, we start using virtual reality as well. Um, so they provide not only qualitative, but also quantitative metrics with the graph analysis. And it identify, uh, you know, the 3D image space at risk for underdiagnosis, so the missing cases. Um, so our eye tracking system is actually the real time. 
and it is the first real radiology room settings and um, it can be used for you know the different you know the applications like the lung prostate brain we, we try this for multiple applications and without having actually significant problems uh, it can be set up for different radiologists based on the you know the experience level of the radiologist actually it can be adapted also the, this algorithm actually initially it is baseline but for every radiologist we didn't do it yet but now we try actually uh, doing this now uh, using the active learning like you can actually adapt the algorithms based on how they actually visualize how they you know, do visual search how they evaluate it so it's going to be really personalized ai algorithms every day actually based on you know how they search the you know the uh, scans so another thing is that you see the system is really gener generic so if you have a better algorithm than capsule just replace it it's gonna work for if you have a better you know clustering system or specification you can really replace it the components are actually uh you know smoothly integrated to each other so uh, it is not really a drawback but it is a strength of the algorithm that uh, you know you can improve the algorithms that will improve the overall system and unlike like the you know of course we use also you know transformers now and all other you know the attention based systems but here the attention mechanism is really the true attention like the biological attention it comes directly from the gaze patterns uh, and it allows actually you know many different um, you know the applications as well not only like this three classification detection and other things but ground truth labeling which is a huge issue in medical imaging um, yeah, that was actually the all. And uh, so I needed to include this, you know, the funding that provide us this, you know, the support and this great work. And thank you very much for listening. And sorry about the videos again. Well, thank you very much for this uh, nice presentation. Uh, it was really, really good. Uh, well, you incorporate the real radiologists. In well, do you have any questions? From the audience, let's first ask to the audience while they think. Okay, so now I think we're going to ask. Yeah, All right. Uh, I have some questions. Vasha John, thank you for this nice presentation. Um, I have, um, I wonder how you handle the disagreement between different an annotators. So the experts might have different labels, right? How do you handle that? So in, in, for example, in multitask learning, so we have this uncertainty uh, measurements usually uh, included. Let me see where this MTL formulation. Yeah, here. So, you know, what, what you, you try to usually have, the, we have the mean score, like let's mm -hmm. say four radiologists score something. We try to get the mean score for each of them. Uh, so that was our initial studies. Currently, what we do actually is that we don't really do mean score anymore. Uh, so we include now uncertainty measurements for every prediction. So every prediction has also, uh, you know, the standard deviation or uh, reliability score, let's say. But initially, we were taking the mean score of it. So you are using aleatoric uncertainty? Yes. Okay. Um, then, um, so you have strong imbalance problem, actually. So the... Yeah tumor regions are just small portions of the overall images. So do you use any tricks to mitigate that? Yes, data augmentation like everybody used. So we use the, you know, the data augmentation, uh, but is it really carefully choosing data augmentation this time because um, you don't really want to distort to, you know, the shape of it. So now there are actually some tools like keep argument and auto argument kind of systems. Uh, so we remove those computer vision based data augmentation and just keep, uh, you know, things that is more suitable for medical imaging because so the idea was actually very simple, we have a simple check classification. So once you distort the images if the classification label changes we don't use that data augmentation, but we do a lot of data augmentation to balance the problem. Okay, so actually we work on similar problems. Um... Um, we, we work in detection and uh, we have strong imbalance in detection and we develop proposal some better strategies maybe we can talk about that later. yeah that will be really great yes that will be really nice it's, it's a it's an unsolved problem yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes thank you 
ulaşacağım. What uh, so what you do is more like a you know white box explanations. So what do you think about uh, black box explanations where you take a model already trained and try to explain it afterwards? Yeah, uh, it's well, ad hoc, right? It's an ad hoc method. Mm -hmm. So um, so in our case, the motivation was really coming from like you know the how radiologists are going to interpret the results. So uh, we we really avoided like uh, interpretation or interpretability. Uh, in in medical imaging settings, it may be you know. So like I can give just one example, but it's not generic. Just I, I promise. Probably there is a huge promise there too. But one explanation was this: so we uh, have imaging data and we have some uh, patient data, and we try to uh, classify pancreatic cancer cases for like high risk or low risk, which which patients are gonna get pancreatic cases. We know that actually something is uh, actually uh, problematic in black box explanation. And then when we go deeper and we notice that one of the variable uh, uh, is really dominating the others, when we define that variable, it was like the patient comes to the hospital with the uh, stomach pain. And let's say you have millions of data from images like pixels and many other things, but this single parameter was dominating. So all the patients who have stomach pain was considered like high risk pancreatic cancer. So then we, you know, you cannot really convince radiologists with that. So that's why we switch into radiographical explanations and plus visual explanations that I tried to show like the other, you know, this grad cam and IBA. So combination of them actually works so far for black box. Like, you know, our experiments again, like was not really successful, uh, but it is open to, you know, uh, you know, open to development that field, yeah. Okay. I know there are some algorithms available, but none of them really work out for us. No, oh, okay. So my uh, student of mine is working on it currently. So we use Lime, for example, to take- Lime and Shep and Shep, yes. right? So yes. Unfortunately, none of them really work us, but I cannot really generalize. Like mm -hmm. I said before, many of these machine learning and computer vision methods is not easy to integrate medical imaging. So you really need to adapt. No. Uh, so it's a good PhD topic. Good luck. For <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Do we have other questions? Okay. 